Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Neither of his parents finished high school, but the Crutchers had big dreams for their son, Ron. He's a leader in both the world of classical music and higher education. Up next on Another View, meet Dr. Ronald Crutcher, president of the University of Richmond and internationally renowned classical cellist. He's also an author, and his book is called I Had No Idea You Were Black. Stay tuned for a frank and open discussion of navigating race as an African-American leader. That's next on Another View, coming up right after these national, regional, and local headlines from NPR and WHRV News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Our guest today on Another View is a brilliant leader in both academia and the arts, and he's learned some lessons along the way about what it means to be black and in charge in worlds where he often is the only one. We are pleased to welcome to Another View, Dr. Ronald Crutcher, president of the University of Richmond, classical cellist, and author of I Had No Idea You Were Black. Hello, Dr. Crutcher. How are you? Doing very well, Barbara. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. So I have to tell you, when I saw the title of your book, I had to chuckle to myself because I thought if I had a dime for every time someone has said that to me, <laughs> <laughs> I might have a nice little nest egg. <laughs> I, I actually have, I, I have heard that many oftentimes from people who've, who've seen the book or who know the, the title of the book. Absolutely. So can you tell us what the circumstances were around your um, receiving that information? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and, and I'll also say to you, uh, many, some people have asked me, was that the original title of the book? And, uh-huh. the, and the answer is no, that was not my original title. My original title was much more boring. <laughs> but it was my, it was my editor who, uh, once she, uh, she knew about the story. So what happened is in 1997, I was the head of the uh, Butler School of Music, and I had been for a couple of years trying to get a meeting with the head of a foundation that provided scholarships to violin students. Mm-hmm. So I drove down to Houston to meet the head of the foundation. He was the CEO of a, an oil company. And literally, after we were, we were shaking hands, and I was lowering myself to my seat when he looked at me, and he said, I had no idea you were black. Mm-hmm. And at first, I was, I was thinking, oh, you know, I was, I was angry. Like I came all the way down here, I did all this, and then I thought, okay, just listen, see where this is going. Mm. And the next thing he said was, maybe you can help me. My my wife and I have been going to the Aspen Music Festival for more than thirty years, and we rarely see any black violinist. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And that was my opportunity to engage him in a conversation about why it was what we were doing at the University of Texas, to tell him about a black violinist who was at UT at the time, who had come there from the Cleveland Institute of Music, where I had been as, uh, as uh, where I had served as dean. Mm-hmm. And uh, and along the short of it is, I got the money that I wanted. Um, and 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 that young young woman actually is now a member of the Cleveland Orchestra. Uh-huh. And I. I use that often as a cautionary tale when I'm with my mentoring group to, you know, to say, okay, what's a more elegant way that the man could have gotten into this conversation? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know. Uh, well, but, you, know, you found yourself, though, in a lot of instances where you were the only one or um, yeah. or a one of few. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I will tell you in full disclosure, well, with my company, Sharing Info LLC, I do something that you're not crazy about, which is diversity and inclusion 
inclusion training, but <laughs> we are working with the um, Virginia Symphony Orchestra, which has made oh. a determination to really um, delve into becoming a more inclusive organization. And they have specifically targeted uh, trying to get more uh, involvement from African American, uh, the African American community. But mm-hmm. one of the issues is that the orchestra currently has no yeah. Um, yeah. people of color at all. Yeah. Now with Beverly yeah. Baker retiring, and the musicians tell me that part of the issue is that they feel that students of color start too late in the process of learning an instrument, and they never can get caught up to a point where they are are um, can perform at a level that is orchestra material. And you didn't start playing the cello until you were 14. Right. So I'm wondering, you know, what do you think about that perspective? And, yeah. and is well, that... I don't buy it. I okay. don't buy it. Okay. Uh, in fact, I actually went uh, a couple of years ago, went up to Boston where I used to live, the Boston Symphony, along with the uh, the Boston, I think it's called Community Art School, where one of my mentees is the head had a grant from the Mellon Foundation, and, and he had been told this, that, that my, my mentee, who was the head of the community school, had been told the same thing by the Boston Symphony people, that, you know, you have to start when you're in elementary school. Yeah. It is true that most really fine string players start early on, but I can name any number of string players and other people of, of color and otherwise who started later. Uh, you know, now, what what is necessary is that when you begin – you have to put in a lot of time of practicing, which is what I did. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you have to, you know. But to say that you that uh, you have to begin by a certain age or you can't make it is just totally inaccurate. Um, to say that most people start earlier, yes, that's accurate. And by the way, I'm not against diversity and inclusion <laughs> training. I'm just saying a lot of times companies, schools, organizations use that as a cop out. You have to go deeper than that to, because they only of, because they only do the training and and right. I agree with you in that because I look for opportunities where companies and um, and organizations are in it for the long haul as yeah. opposed yeah. to you know come in do a one day training and you're done. That's right. I agree. Exactly. I agree with you 100 percent there. But I am yeah. curious as to why you don't like the word microaggressions. Um, yeah, be, because I, I I tell you why. From my perspective, so where I sit as a 74-year-old black man, as I observe young people in particular, what I, I see less and less of these days is the ability to give people the benefit of the doubt, mm. and to and and to and, and that is that is to say, not to assume that because a person said something to you that they're racist or they're sexist or whatever. I mean, if there is a pattern of behavior, then that's a different kind of a a thing. Um, And so for me, um, I I, I guess uh, the way I I look at it is that it, 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 it doesn't, I think if you focus too much on the microaggressions, you can very easily kind of, Mark people off your list who mm. otherwise could become allies simply because they made a mistake or they took a misstep. Mm-hmm. So we don't give people the benefit of the doubt enough. Yeah, you know. Well, I think then, and, that, and mm-hmm. I, let me tell you why I think that is. Sure. And part of that has to do with with the media, with the uh, with, with the social media. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you know canceling someone or or you know unfriending someone. Uh, you you can it, you can do it too easily and um uh and and so you know because I, I my my feeling is if we're going to in this country find a way to really deal deeply and authentically and, and systematic or not authentically with the r- r- racial issues that we have faced for far too long it's only going to be when people in, engage with each other and they use their heads and their hearts in that engagement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, you, your background was very interesting. Um, you were 14 when you 
decided to play the cello, um, not necessarily because you loved that instrument <laughs> in the sense of, you know, I've got to play the cello. Um, I wonder if you tell us a little bit about your your growing up and how you got to um, become a cello player. Surely, surely. So, uh, you know, it, it, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, and I, my, both of my parents loved music but neither of them was a musician. My father was an amateur singer. He sang in a, a, a men's group. But they they encouraged me to participate in music. So I started singing at six in the in the at Zion Baptist Church. I sang a solo, and then I started singing more there. And my mother, you know, had me take piano lessons. They sent us to the hear the Cincinnati Symphony to see the Cincinnati Children's Theater. Uh, but as you said, neither, neither my parents had gone to college. They 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 left school before they fin- before they finished high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but they both had high aspirations for their uh, their children. And and um, so when I was I, in the eighth grade, I was in the Samuel Ogg Junior High Choir in Cincinnati, one of the best junior high choirs in the state of Ohio, conducted by. Dr. Mr. Clyde Williams, the first black graduate of the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, mm-hmm. and the band director walked in and he said, "We have a program where you can learn to play an instrument this summer. You know, I'd like to. Is anyone interested?" And I raised my hand. I have no idea why I raised my hand. It just sounded interesting to me. There were three of us who raised their hands, <laughs> and uh, he said, "Come to my office after school." He gave us a test, and he said to me, "You have almost perfect pitch. You can choose any instrument you want to." you want to uh, choose. Mm. I love the string instruments, but I thought if I played the violin, I'd have to stand up. And I was quite overweight at the time. Mm -hmm. But I thought if you play the cello, you sit down. Mm. And that's how I chose the cello. (laughs) Pretty practical. (laughs) Very practical. Um, Now, I'll tell you something interesting. uh, and, And immediately, I mean, I immediately, there was something about that instrument that just touched my soul. I fell in love with it. I couldn't put it down. I didn't even know. I, he allowed me to take it home. I didn't know what I was doing, so I actually broke the string Uh-oh. Uh, the first time because <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. But then I, you know, I started taking the classes and I practiced just, I mean, I, 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 I I couldn't I couldn't give it up. It was when it came time to go to Boy Scout camp. My father was a scout leader and I've been going to Boy Scout camp since I was 10 years old. Um I didn't want to go and of course my father said, "Well, you know, you will be you will be going to Boy Scout camp." <laughs> and I couldn't take my cello and so I would sit in campfires and, you know, pretend I was playing the cello on my arm. Wow. The fingering practicing shifting because I just learned to shift. Um and 8 months later I played um the two movements of the of the Bach first suite at a competition at the local university, Miami University and the cello professor in Miami happened to be in the audience. She was impressed with like that I could play so well after such a short period of time and offered to teach me free of charge. It didn't happen quite in that sequence actually. She mm-hmm. invited me to music camp first. And gotcha. then after being at the music camp for two weeks um, she said to my parents, if you will get him here every Saturday, I will teach him free of charge. How far of a distance is it from Cincinnati to the um, University of Miami? Well, it's 35. It's Miami University. Miami University. Ohio. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, and, it, and it's named Miami because the Miami Indians were located in the Miami Valley before they were moved by the government to Oklahoma. Ah, okay. Uh, in fact, the man who uh, founded Miami, Florida, got the name from the Miami Indians because he grew up in the Miami Valley. Mm. Miami is okay. all over. It, it's it, anyway, all over the place. <laughs> it's uh, 35 miles, but the bus goes. So I get the bus at 740 on Saturday morning. It will go from Cincinnati to Hamilton, which is going northeast when Oxford is actually northwest. Oh. Cincinnati, Hamilton to Oxford. So it took 90 minutes to get there. And every Saturday you would be there. She became, every Saturday. She became, became quite, a, she was a mentor um, yes. of, of of the higher level, though. I mean, she really was involved in your life from that point yes. on. Yes, she, she became very good friends with my parents. Mm-hmm. And there was something that, um, and, and, and I was going to say there was something that she saw in me, but I have to say, 
she had that she had a special relationship with each of her students. She was an amazing teacher. And there is actually on on Facebook there's a web page devoted to her for, by, put together by by her students. Um and uh, she she really saw some some a special talent in in me. I had to, I mean basically when I when she started teaching me, I mean she taught me how to play the cello as an athlete. Mm. And you know, taught and and I learned how my body, you know, how you, how your body interacts with the instrument. She also helped me to play the cello in such a way that I could ensure that what came out of the instrument was was exactly what I was imagining in my mind's eye, right? Well, in my mind, what that in other words, what I was thinking I was playing was actually coming, coming out. out. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, shortly after I started playing, uh, studying with her, she asked my parents if she could take me over to um, Richmond, Indiana, which is only <laughs> twenty minutes away, mm-hmm. to meet a famous musical family, the Klemperer family. And um, I went over and played for them. Uh, he had the Mr. Klemperer had four children, and their youngest daughter uh, was Erica Klemperer. I was 15 at that time, and she was 12. And if fast forward, uh, she and I and her husband Gordon Back have been playing in a trio, the Klemperer trio, together for 40 years. Wow. That's incredible. Um, you know, when you were placed in all of these different, uh, because you ultimately, I know I'm trying to condense the book into a short amount of time, <laughs> but 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 you ultimately wind up um, playing, um, going to various um, music schools and camps, and you wound up overseas, and you were always in these positions where there weren't other black kids or there were very few. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. What made you so comfortable? to be able to function in in those arenas? Well, there there are a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Um, One was really um, the fact that very early on, as you read in the book, um, when I was seven years old, I had my first encounter with overt racism. Mm -hmm. And after that encounter, I will never forget, my father, when we got back home, took me, he sat me and my my brother me down, and he said, you know, there will be people, there will be white people in this country who will not appreciate who you are because you're black. And he said, sometimes you won't, you won't really know who, you know, is, is prejudiced against you and who's not. But Mm -hmm. he said, one thing you should always keep in mind, you should always expect to be treated well. And you should all, you should know that you have as much right for air to all of the uh, the, uh, the 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 positive things that the uni- that the the United States of America can offer you as 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 anybody else mm-hmm. as long as you're willing to work for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is that I learned early on playing the cello through chamber music that music was a way that where when 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 I when I sat down to play chamber music play a qu- qu- quartet with a group you know remember in, with a in the chamber music group, there's no conductor, right. unlike an orchestra. You make the decisions have to be made collaboratively. And so, you know, you learn how to kind of circumvent any differences that you have and just make music mm. and, and make musical decisions collectively, regardless of what color you are, what, what race you are, what what ethnicity, you know, even, even if you don't speak the same language, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of my my mantra. And then the third thing that happened too was that my father, as he, he used to say to us when we were younger, uh, really, no, no matter where you go, even if you're, you're there, there are no, 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 no other black people there, you know, get to know people. Um, they may be different from you, and they may have different perspectives, but you'll learn a lot from them. Uh, get to know them, um, and and so that was just. That was just, uh, you know, what what I what I learned to do. And your mom conditioning. And your mom also spent time with you and your brother teaching you all manners and <laughs> to speak the king's English, right? <laughs> well, what I was going to say, I just this morning had said said to a staff member, I often say to my to to my colleagues, don't let A.J. Crutcher Jr. show up. My father was <laughs> my father crucified the King's English, and um, and and when I was little, I was really embarrassed by that. I mean, I you know mm-hmm. I've, I I learned 
thank I, I, mean, I was able to tell him, thank God, we both lived long enough for I could could tell him how much I loved him and and how much I I learned from him. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I wouldn't be the person I am today. But my, yes, my mother taught us. My mother corrected our English, our grammar. Um, she, you know, we dressed, a, we had to dress a certain way. And the interesting thing, though, my mother never, ever said to us, do not speak like your father. Those mm-hmm. words never came from her mouth. Mm-hmm. And in fact, years later, my brother, my middle brother married a woman who used to make fun of my father, the way my father would speak. And my mother would be furious at her. It really yeah. angered her yeah. because she was in love. I mean, they were married for 59 years before she, she, uh, before my mother passed away. Um, you know, mm-hmm. she, it, it, so, I, and, and I, I didn't, as a child, I didn't understand that dynamic. Of course, as a child, I used to pray that, that God would make my father more like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I was embarrassed. Yeah. I was embarrassed by yeah. him. I really, I have to be honest. I was, um, well, I'm glad that but, you had a chance to talk to him and 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 yeah. to be able to clear that, um, yeah. you know, as as father son. Um, you went to Germany, and you yes. spoke fluent. You learned to speak fluent German, and you performed there. You stayed there for five years or so, mm-hmm. if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. Um, yes. And you said in the book that that being black in Germany was different than yes. being black in America. Can you tell us yeah. why? Yes, yes. So, and what I what I specifically I said I felt I realized one day after a few happening there for a few months that I for the first time in my life felt life felt unencumbered by race by being the fact that I was black because even though you know I just talked to, said to you you know I I I, I was comfortable being around in, in all these groups in the back of my mind you're always thinking you know how wondering how people are going to respond to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in Germany, what I found, and and I, and I think the, the what I what I found is that people appreciated the fact that I was a cellist and I was a musician, and they they really valued professional musicians in ways that Americans did not at that time. I didn't have to explain to anyone why I decided to become a cellist. And then secondly, after I had been at the Goethe Institute for two months. My teacher said to me specifically, he said, when you go to Bonn, people are going to automatically start speak English to you because it's clear you're not German, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're black. He said, do not speak English back to them. Speak only German back to them. The best advice anyone could have ever given to me because what you discover is that they say something to you in English, you respond in German and try to you know, do it as well as you can. Mm-hmm. Ah, it comes from Deutsch. And th- their whole demeanor changes. Wow. Because you're relating was, to them on their, in, on, in exactly. their na- native language. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I went, what would happen, Barbara, is I would have my friends and say, to, say, to, say to me, you know, you know I, I, don't think, I don't think of you as American. You know, I don't. I don't think of you. As, I think of you. You know, you you're you're as European as I am, and 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 I got in. I sometimes get into arguments. Well, I am a black man. <laughs> I'm a very proud black man, but uh, that was the I- issue. And I will tell you, my wife will will tell you this. We've been going back to Germany uh, almost every year since 1979 when we were married. We did our honeymoon there. Mm-hmm. When I go there, she said it's like I'm a. It's like I'm coming home. It's a, I, I have a real affinity, and I have to give credit to the family that I lived with for three years, the Patriot family, for helping to helping me to develop that affinity. I don't know that I would have developed it had I been had I just lived in somebody's house, you know, rented a room. I mean, mm-hmm. I lived. They they had four boys when I moved in with them in 1972. They were seven, eight, nine, and eleven. Three of the boys had February birthdays. My birthday's in February. She would have birthday parties for me. She washed my clothes. She said, I'm doing, I'm washing clothes every day. Just put your clothes in there with the boys. And she would leave them on the steps. So you really became a part of the family. I became a part of the family. We're Mm -hmm. still close. We, we, you Mm -hmm. know, they've, three of the boys have been to, actually one of them lives in, in DC, but the other two who live in Germany have been to see us here. Um, and, and, um, we had hoped to go back to their family reunion this July, but 
because I wasn't sure that we that what what the state of COVID was going to be. Mm-hmm. We're going to go later. Mm -hmm. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Dr. Ronald Crutcher, president of the University of Richmond, an internationally renowned classical cellist and author of I Had No Idea You Were Black. Dr. Crutcher, do you did you have to code switch within between family and your professional life often? (laughs) You called I'm it laughing. a different term, but I know you know what I mean. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I know, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, what I remember as a, as a child, I have I have two cousins in Cincinnati, two female cousins, with whom I'm still very very close, and and they're not really even blood cousins. They are actually their their mother was my mother's cousin's closest friend, and they they're like a part of our family. But mm-hmm. I, I spent a lot of time with them, and. You know, it, it and and yet and and then when I when I when I went to school, I went to a predominantly white, predominantly Jewish, actually, high school in Cincinnati, and I remember thinking, I mean, the way I talk with them was very different <laughs> than the way I I talked in in school, and so I mean, it is it is what it is. I mean, you do that. Yeah, exactly. So you know? let's move on to your. So you 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 were a cellist. You you came back to the United States, and you got into higher education. Um, and I'm curious. I think it's really interesting. Just as an aside, the VSO announced yesterday their newest uh, music director. His name is Eric Jacobson, and um, he's a cellist and conductor. Oh. <laughs> so, wow. but I know that you talk very specifically in the book about. Things that you learn through music that you translate into leadership, yes. and and I'd love to hear, yes. um, particularly starting with the the whole idea of active listening, um, and yes. why that's so critical. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually uh, I started thinking about this in two thousand four when I became president of Wheaton College. So before I came to Richmond, I was president of Wheaton College in Massachusetts for ten years, and the Chronicle of Higher Education asked me to do. A, an essay on the impact of my chamber music experience on my leadership style. And the active listening piece is, I think, more important today than ever before. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's related to, you know, a, a, to being a chamber musician. You know, again, the point being that in a chamber group, when chamber music is really defined, but two or more uh, uh, with, with uh, musicians playing together, one on a part, no no conductor. You have to listen closely because that's the only way you're going to play. You're going to be able to play together because there's no nobody, uh, there's no conductor marking the beat for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I find in today's society, with the, all the talking heads, is that people don't really listen. If you if you if you watch the talking heads on the news programs, you can see in their eyes they're not listening really while someone else is talking they're in they're they're thinking you know about how they can kind of one up the person or mm-hmm. or respond to the individual as opposed to really actively listening so you can hear what the person is saying and 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 listening for understanding mm-hmm. right that's mm-hmm. uh, that's that and that's critically important now more than ever before at a time when our our nation is polarized like like never before like like never before and you also had that experience on your campus as you um as there was some pushback on uh a person i believe who was anti lgbtq um and yes. was come into campus and there were yeah. there was vote you know active opposition <laughs> to listening to the other side yeah, my question to you is because because you know you state very clearly um, the purpose of a liberal education, of a college liberal education, is to be able to connect the dots by hearing all different perspectives. Um, right. And I, my question, though, is how do you determine or is it appropriate to determine whether someone is bringing value in their opposition or if yes. they are spewing hate in their yeah. opposition? <laughs> Well, what, well, so let, let me, let me, yeah, yeah, and, and, that's, and that's a valid, that's a valid question. And what I would say in terms of speakers, so you know, in mm-hmm. terms of this, this, the, the person who came, he he had, was an individual who'd written a book mm-hmm. called, I think, something like "When Sally Became Harriet," something like that. Mm-hmm. His book 
had been cited, his name is Ryan Anderson, Mm -hmm. his book had been cited by several Supreme Court justices in cases. And so Uh our law faculty felt it was important for our law students to note, to hear this guy. Now, they did have another law professor who did a rebuttal, who provided Mm -hmm. a rebuttal. Um, And so uh, to, to answer your question specifically, you know, in terms of, of inviting speakers to campus, you, know, you it, it has to, there has to be, from my perspective at least, mm-hmm. there has to be an intellectually valid reason for wanting to have that person there. So, for instance, mm-hmm. I can find no intellectually valuable reason to invite Richard Spencer to campus. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, to me, there mm-hmm. is no, I mean, I, 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 he, 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 you know, he, he does nothing but spew hatred. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's no reason. So there's no for intellectual him. reason to, to no. do that. I got you. Mm-hmm. No, you know, and 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 so and the other the the under underlying issue with your that I think you're getting to with your question is well, you know, a lot of uh, what our what our faculty were saying, this guy is uh, this guy Ryan Anderson is obviously um, anti-trans. This is going to be hurtful to our students. And so what I said in my response was, you know, number one, in no way does his presence on our campus represent, uh, the, 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 in no way does it mean we're going to be any, any less um, faithful with respect to our focus on providing and sustaining and fostering a thriving and inclusive campus. Gotcha. Um, environment for our, our students here. And and secondly, I don't agree with the man, the, the person mm-hmm. at, at mm-hmm. all. However, mm-hmm. our law professors feel that our students need to hear from him because his book is being used, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing is, too, that at, at the same time, we I, I, I said in that letter, please reach out and support our trans and LBGQ2 students. During this time, now as it turned out, actually, what happens that that people wore white shirts that came to protest silently and respectfully. That some had signs. The mm-hmm. lecture took place as it it was uh, uh, scheduled to take place, and uh, there was a rebuttal, question and answered, and, and it came off. It was it was was fine. I wonder, as a college president of, uh, especially for a uh, private university. Um, fundraising obviously is is an ongoing uh, pursuit that you must do um, with others, and I'm wondering what your perspective is on what's going on with Nicole Hannah Jones at uh, UNC right now. Um, she wrote, is the author of the 1619 yeah. Project oh, with yeah. the New no, York I, Times, I, 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 <laughs> Just, and I've read all of I've read her, most of her essays. I can't say I read all of her essays, but mm-hmm. I certainly read the essays related to that that project, which was magnificent. And you know, it's clear it's clear that uh, by not um, granting her tenure, it was this was a, a political statement, and, and and the whole idea of the donor. Um, the major donor for whom the, the School of Journalism is named um, wrote emails, apparently, um, uh, opposing her position as a tenured uh, chair. Um, oh, how much? Oh, I didn't. Now that part, I didn't. Yeah, that I just came. That. that just came out um, as uh, from uh, Inside Higher Ed, uh, and apparently he lobbied against her being um, hired or being uh, given a tenured position. And I wonder, you know, how do you balance that as a college president? You know, you've got a major donor. Clearly, right. he gave enough money that he's that the school is named after him. Um, yeah. And and where does that line stop between what well, you do okay. on a day to day basis and what the donor can control? Yes. Well, well, the line stops at when that when that when the, the, the that, that donor crosses the line when he does something which is antithetical to the the values of the not your own personal values but the sure. values of the university. Gotcha. That's where it stops, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And then you you, you, know, you you either try to work out something with the donor, or then you say, okay, I'm I'm speaking for Ronald Crutcher here. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we'll we'll make, we'll make arrangements for you to get your money back. That's a strong. Take your name off. You know, and and one of your five in your five principles um, for effective leadership, you talk about the whole idea of building an ethical foundation for the yes. work that you do. Yes. So you've got to be brave, huh? 
You have to be, you have to be brave. And you know, and so, and sometimes it's easier. I mean, you know, I, I yeah. As a, I'm 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 saying that to you right now, but sure. I'm, the, what, what, so, but one of the issues that you have to deal with is you can get pushback from your from your uh, trustees mm-hmm. or from a, a certain folks, and so then you have to really then you're laying things on the line. Yeah. So you have to <laughs> make that really, decision as to which you way. You have to make yeah. that decision. Mm-hmm. And then if and if you know if you can't if the person's not rational enough if they're if they're that hard nosed about it because especially if you I mean I I I used to be in the University of North Carolina system as in fact I started out um, I, um, I know that's where I was promoted and tenured the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. <laughs> I, I know it know, well. <laughs> I, I I don't know what their you know what their track record is, but I would venture to say there are not many people of her caliber who've been brought in at the mm-hmm. senior level who have not been tenured. Yes. Well, it'll be interesting uh, to keep our eye on what's, what yeah. uh, no, I'm what happens there. Uh, definitely. So, I went, and we're almost out of time, so I wanted to get down to your um, the five principles you say that are essential for effective leadership. It's develop a means of remaining focused, build an ethical foundation, build a network of developmental relationships, race and gender matter, but they alone do not determine your fate. And don't forget to take out time for yourself and your family. Um, how did you come to those five? <laughs> how about that? <laughs> In an well, elevator there used, speech. <laughs> there used to be seven, actually. When, ah. I first, when I first, I gave it, this is from a speech I gave back in 2006, and there were seven. Um, I just, as I just thought through, you know, uh, it, it's rather, yeah, and when I, when I, 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 I Distilled it down to five because I thought seven was too many, <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but I mean, the, the first point of you know remaining focused, remaining centered is critically important because, particularly today, for anybody who's in a leadership position, given all the craziness that's going on, if you can't find a way to um, uh, to not allow the vicissitudes of the day to totally drain your energy, mm. right? Then it, it, it's, it, it can lead to real problems. And so it can, you know, I say you can meditate, you can run, you can swim, you can pray, you can do yoga. I mean, there are lots of different ways to do it, but mm-hmm. it's based on that, that Quaker, this Quaker saying of, you know, this Quaker notice notion of centering. Mm-hmm. And I often make the analogy or the, you remember the little bozo dolls? Yes. Are you old enough? To, where, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, you, I'm old you, enough. <laughs> you, hit the, you, you hit the bozo doll and it comes right back up to the same place. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's like centering. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. anything that knocks you off your feet, you can take a deep breath, you know, go meditate, and you're right back. And you're right back where you need to be. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that doll in quite a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then you know, ethic. I mean, just be, be the, you know, the the, the 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 having an ethical foundation. That's just as I said in in the book. Everyone doesn't have to. You don't have to have the same ethical foundation that I have. But you have to. To me, in my world, it has to be m- more than about simply the money. Mm-hmm. I mean, money is important. You need money to to live, right? Mm-hmm. And and you're not always going to be in a, in a position to to. Um, to make that determination, because at the beginning of your career, for instance, it, do, it wouldn't be, it might not be wise to do that. But ultimately, right. that should be your goal. Okay. Okay. And the developmental relationships. What's yeah, the so difference? The, well, men- mentoring is critically important. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's and and it's a theme in my book because it's been critical to and critically important to me and to my wife, Dr. Betty Neal Crutcher. Mm-hmm. And um and. And I, a couple of things I'd say there. First, you need many mentors in your life. I mean, I still have mentors I rely on uh, mm. at the age of 74, mm. I, yeah, even though, you know, I'm doing more mentoring than I'm being mentored. Sure. But nonetheless, you still have that. And and um, uh, and, and then also the, the fact that you have to sometimes be proactive. You can't just sit back and expect people to come and say, I want to mentor you. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, people are flattered if you go to them and say, you know, I really, I'd love to come and, you know, and get just get, have a have a talk with you to hear what you know about what you're doing, blah 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 blah. 
And then with respect back to, to to race, what I meant by that, in, in there is that really you need to be aware as a black person or a person of color, or, mm-hmm. or I could say the same thing for women too. You need be, to be aware. Yes, of the I think of the fact that you are black or you're a woman, but and and that you have special contributions you can make when you're on committees or on uh, commissions, and so therefore it's an extra added burden, but but it's important for you to speak to for, for people around you to hear your perspective mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you're there for a reason. Mm-hmm. Right, because mm-hmm. your perspective is likely to be different, not always, but likely, and can be critically important. And then you have to take care of yourself. Yes. And 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 for me, my my daughter, we have only one child. My daughter will tell you, there's never been a time in her life when she needed me when I wasn't there for her. And it doesn't make any difference who I'm talking with. If my daughter calls, I'm going to answer the phone. Yeah. So, you know, you talk about and you're in a, a, a predominantly white institution um, and there's a lot of, of very deliberate work. Um, I was very impressed when I was reading the uh, website about um, uh, University of Richmond and the embracing of your history, the mm-hmm. good and the bad and yeah. um, and, and working towards the, those things and the work that you're doing with faculty and so forth. Um, You really encourage that intergroup conversation as going back again, as we were talking about the active listening. And I wonder, what is your perspective then on HBCUs? Um, Because, you know, you're talking about integration and I'm not saying that all HBCUs are all black because they're not. Um, they they have a, 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 a very um, a multicultural um, student populations. But uh, but I know your daughter went to Hampton and. Yes. um and, and my I'm wife just, went to Tuskegee. And your wife went to Tuskegee. So I'm just wondering how you how you see the role of uh, historically black colleges and universities um, in, in in juxtaposed with the work that you're doing in predominantly white university. Yeah. Well, I, I think I mean, I think they're critically uh, important mm-hmm. for um, f- today in particular, um, because I think that um, they really, really. Uh, can pro- they provide a great foundation for young people. I mean, they certainly did for for my, my wife and for my daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, and and for me, I don't see it's not an either or. I think uh-huh. you know HBCUs. For instance, I really I, if I if I had not been a cellist, I really wanted to go to Morehouse. Mm. I would have wanted to go to Morehouse, but mm-hmm. Morehouse, I I, I uh, you know, there's no cello teacher at Morehouse. <laughs> 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 at least at that time, there was right, not. right. Um, and, and 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 it just didn't make sense at the time. But 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 I no I I I I would say uh, in particular and and you know if I had my druthers, what I would l- l- love to to do is to ensure that particularly well I would say black and white students, but particularly black students mm-hmm. had an opportunity to experience both. So that a black student at the University of Richmond could do a, a semester or a year at, at an HBCU, Spelman, and at an HBCU, versa. exactly. Got you. Right to to get that, uh, but I, no, I think they are critically uh, important to still just as important now. Sadly, I mean, I should when I say sadly, I mean that uh, you know my daughter chose Hampton because she had gone to she gone to predominantly white schools mm-hmm. her entire life. And she wanted to be in an environment where there were other people who looked like her, who had had similar experiences mm-hmm. to hers. I mean, you know, having gone, you know, she traveled mm-hmm. abroad, had been abroad several times before she even went to high school. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... And, and she had that experience at Hampton and loved it. That's interesting because I, I I did the same thing. I I went to predominantly white schools all the way up to college, and I went to Bennett College um, mm-hmm. because oh, I Bennett, wanted Bennett yes <laughs> yes I'm a Bennett Bell uh, because I wanted that that experience and that yes. connection. Um, and so I think that that's that's important. Um, we've got about four minutes left in the conversation, and I want to ask you: Has anyone said to you recently, "I had no idea you were black"? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. Anyone, yes, anyone. 
No one has said it to me recently, but I have noted there there is um, there was a situation um, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, where I met someone for the first time, uh, someone I'd been talking to for the first time, and I could see in their face that they didn't realize I was black. Yeah. <laughs> but it has no no one has that no one has no no that's the only situation. Do you think? Although, uh, although I can tell you this, I have uh-huh. had conver- I have had conversations with folks. There, I'm trying to remember that, 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 that one, a conversation where it was clear to me that the person didn't know I was black. On the phone, you were, started, t- were you talking to them yes, on the phone? Mm-hmm. On the telephone, because <laughs> they were, they started talking about George. <laughs> oh, and I I just I listened for a while. I said, mm, "You do realize I'm black, don't you?" Silence at the end. Oh well, you know, I was. Uh, I, 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 I <laughs> you know, it, it is so funny, Doctor Crutcher. I had a um, when I was working in Baltimore back in the late eighties, um, and I very make a very long story short. I was talking to a woman. She um, told me on the phone that she hated black people. Oh, Lord. And when I told her I was black, she said, oh, my God, I thought I was talking to a white woman. And oh, she just came right out. <laughs> she just she did. She did. She just she just really came out with it. So so in the last two minutes, what advice would you give to people who are climbing the ladder, who are trying to work for for change and to be as inclusive as possible? What would you tell them? <laughs> well, um, what do you mean, black or white, or just in but, general? Black, just in general. But because yeah. it needs to go on both sides. It can't just it be it black go people going sides. to whites and whites going. To, it's got to be both. So what? What I what I would say is that you know just be, be don't ever make assumptions about another person's background, perspectives, um, and, or even what you know. Don't 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 take at face value something that person says. Uh, but be open. Try to get to know them. Ask, ask, you know, ask uh, questions, and then and then listen. Listen for understanding. True. And mm-hmm. and even you know, well, I say to my students all the time, when you sit down with someone with whom you do not agree politically, religiously, whatever, the goal is not necessarily to change their mind. The goal is to listen closely so you have a better understanding about why they hold that particular perspective mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then you know and you walk away i mean you you you, you don't have to be you know you don't have to be, you don't have to be best friends with everybody exactly or even friends with everybody <laughs> Exactly. The name of the book is I Had No Idea You Were Black, Navigating Race on the Road to Leadership by Dr. Ronald A. Crutcher. Thank you so very much for joining us on Another View today. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. I hope to to meet you someday. (laughs) Absolutely. Me too. You take care now and we'll be right back. Uh Uh-huh. I'm with Marcellus, and you all are checking out Another View. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. And welcome back. Whether he's playing, composing, or teaching, Dr. Harvey Stokes is all about the music. The Hampton University professor has had his pieces performed all over the world. And he sat down with our Lisa Godley to share how music has impacted his life and subsequently the lives of his students. We perform for the love of music. So the notion of us not performing music, well, (laughs) that's not going to happen. We're going to perform something. For years, Harvey Stokes has performed with Symphonicity. The community orchestra plays at venues all over Hampton Roads and at least once a month at the Sandler Center in Virginia Beach. This ensemble involves itself in doing new things. When the call came to participate in the MOCA program, I mean, we kind of jumped at it. We've always been in a place to expose new audiences to what we do and uh, this is a great way to do that. 
even in the uh, COVID environment. I had a brother. He played the tuba, he played the oboe, and he was a dancer in Broadway musicals and did a lot of acting in Broadway musicals and so forth. So I watched him like a hawk. And one day, he said, I'm not gonna play the oboe anymore. So he gave me his oboe. He taught me a few notes, and that's when that bug started happening. When he's not playing, he's composing. We've written a lot of music right on this machine. We is me and my muse. God, we kind of work together. We write it here, then we put it on paper. It's got to be in your mind first. I have in my mind what the instruments sound like, as well as what each individual instrument can do in terms of the various melodies that I would devise. So, it's very important to have a sense of what instruments sound like and what orchestras sound like, what bands sound like. And there's no way to do that unless you listen to a lot of music. We are approaching about 70 compositions. We try to write three, four pieces a year. Sometimes it ends up being two pieces because of the length aspect. I mean, if you're writing a symphony, it kind of takes a while. I got to Hampton U in August of 1990, and I've been at Hampton, what, 31 years? The third component in his love of music comes through teaching, something that had to change when the pandemic hit and music classes went virtual. It's good to see everybody here at Hampton. Let's see if we can get our, our review done uh, uh, today so we can give you a test on Friday. There is this band, it's called the Fuzz Band. They tell this story, you know, a lot of their music they wrote as a result of chord progressions they learned in my theory class. When you're listening to music that you've composed, you have this feeling of elation you have this feeling of joy. You have this feeling that you're sharing a part of yourself with people. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. Dr. Stokes is the founder and director of the Computer Music Laboratory at Hampton University and a past recipient of the Edward L. Ham Sr. Distinguished Teaching Award. He says he can't wait to get back in the classroom this fall to, for face-to-face -face interaction with his students. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your life with us here on Another View. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. And don't forget to sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. We're on Facebook, so like us. And I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week on Another View, the Another View Roundtable is back. Don Hester, Alvian Lyons, Carol Pretlow, and Allison Moore are back with wit and wisdom about today's current events. Our theme music is an original composition, especially for Another View, written and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer, and we didn't get a chance last week to say congratulations to Jordan Yowell, Lisa's youngest daughter on her graduating from SCAD, Go Jordan. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer and Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Hey, have you gotten your shot? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? Go maskless, get your shot. <laughs> and now is the time and join us again next Thursday at noon for another view.
Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. 